on the 29th of November 2015. On the panel tonight, we've got Stav, Black Hole Bridger, and Truth Machine. Hey Hello, guys. We all doing all right today? Yeah, evening, pretty right. Yeah, it's absolutely fine, mate. Yep, yeah, okie dokie, thanks. All right, good, good. So we're going to kick off then, uh, Stav. What have you got for us tonight? Oh, ready? It's uh, to do with our uh, Russian friends, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just to uh, carry on from what was it last week? Really, it's all to do with the um, what's happening in the Middle East. With all this talk about the UK probably going to have a parliament vote, <laughs> as they probably will, and they definitely will when they get it through, as we know. Uh, about bombing Syria and what's going on. Basically, this this first um, article from Russian Insider is people are taking their eyes off of what's going on in the Ukraine, and I think things are starting to boil up again there, as this article states. I think this it's also trying to, I think, uh, with all what's going on with the Paris attacks the other week and the refocusing on Syria and everything, uh, this is being forgotten. So. Um, I think the Ukrainian government are up to their old tricks. And um, anyway, I'll read you the article. You can it'll explain it all, really. Uh, it's well, they they called it a whitewash, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Being whitewashed again. Yeah, yeah. It's, the old, it's the old magician's trick, though, isn't it? It's to divert your attention. Yep, exactly. And also, also to put extra pressure on uh, Putin. Yeah, well, you know. It will get. Uh, I think it's going to get. It's going to escalate and escalate and escalate beyond. Well, you guys have ruined story now. You've spoiled all the fun. I know. You've read it. Shall I go on to the next article now? <laughs> no, no, keep with the article. I'd like to hear about it because I'm dyslexic, so it's really handy that people can. You know, this show is really handy for. You know, if you read through it for us, it helps people like myself. Man, I'm sure there's people out there that can't read too good and. You know, it's handy to have people, you know, helping you understand what's going on around the world. So crack on with that. Okay, true. That's great. Well, if you can understand my um, pronunciations of these words with all of one tooth of mine. But anyway, we'll give it a go. Uh, war returns to the Ukraine. Tensions escalate as Ukraine tries to regain international attention, diverting by Syria. Whilst all eyes are on Syria, there has been a steady deterioration of the situation in Ukraine. In violation of the ceasefire shelling of the territories of the two people's republics has resumed and the OSCE has confirmed that the Ukrainian military has moved heavy weapons back to the contact line. The Ukrainians meanwhile have extended their ban on commercial flights to and from Russia by banning also transit flights. Ukraine has placed Crimea under food blockade to the intense embarrassment of its western backers, uh, blah, blah, blah. Kiev should act, should, uh, as regards, see this editorial in the Financial Times, headline Kiev should end, should act to end the blockade of Crimea. It has enlarged this to an energy blockade. Ukraine claims the power lines to Crimea were destroyed by Crimean Tatar activists backed by right sector. Even if this were true, the Ukrainian authorities have done little or nothing to take control of the situation, arrest and punish those responsible for what was, after all, an act of criminal damage or carry out the necessary repairs. Characteristically, most Western governments have said nothing, save that there has been some muted criticism from Germany. Contrast this silence with the furious and wrong accusations regularly made in the West against Russia for its supposed use of energy as a political weapon. All of this is happening to a drumbeat of demands in the Ukrainian media for the country to renounce the Minsk II agreement. The Russians, for their part, have responded by stopping coal supplies to Ukraine. Since Ukraine is again failing to pay for its gas, it seems the Russians intend to stop supplying Ukraine with gas on Tuesday. The two people's republics have also announced that they are stopping their own coal deliveries to Ukraine. These steps increase the prospects of spare power shortages in Ukraine during what is predicted to be a harsh winter. The Russians also due in January to impose sanctions on Ukrainian food imports to Russia, 
This is in retaliation to Ukraine during the EU sanctions against Russia and imposing sanctions of its own. Bizarrely, this is bizarrely this systematic uh, severing of trade links with Russia is being held in parts of the Western media as proof Ukraine is successfully reorienting its trade to the EU away from Russia and is becoming less dependent on Russia. This, of course, takes no account of the damage these actions are doing to the Ukraine's uh, government economy. Let's get rid of that. There has also been an orchestrated attempt in recent weeks on the part of some sections of the Western media to talk up Ukraine's economic situation with claims that it is stabilizing. The US credit agency Moody's has joined in the game by upgrading Ukraine's credit rating. To the very limited extent this is true, it is wholly the consequences of the August ceasefire which stopped the drain of fighting the war on the civilian economy. The actions the Ukrainian government and activists have been doing over the last few weeks puts this in jeopardy. What is causing this sudden deterioration in the situation? At its simplest, it's growing alarm in Ukraine that Western, especially European, support for Ukraine is flagging. It is now widely accepted that Merkel and Obama are becoming increasingly uh, isolated in their instance that the sanctions against Russia be extended. In France, Nicolas Sarkozy Hollande's likely conservative opponent at the presidential election has clearly signaled his opposition to sanctions, aligning himself on this issue with Marine Le Pen. More to the point, in Germans, Mer Germany, Merkel's coalition partners, SPD and CSU, are both becoming openly critical of sanctions policy, which one senses they both probably always disagree. Russian society has already discussed the increasingly rebellious line being taken by Sigmar Gabriel, the, SMP's, the, sorry, the SPD's leader <laughs> and Germany vice-chancellor. Possibly even more important is the call from Horst Schufer, leader of the CSU, the CDU right coalition partner in Merkel's coalition for approachment with Russia. Um, I mean, the article goes on and on and on. Yeah, on. I was just saying, man, it does, doesn't it? It goes on and on. There's so much in there, like... Yeah. Yeah, and none of this is in the public eye. No, 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 because we're, we're, you, you've got so many backroom deals going on, uh, Truth. We, we, you've got... You had this meeting last week with uh, Russia and France working together and they're going to work together uh, um, with their bombing raids in Syria. Then Germany comes out and obviously want to back uh, both France and Russia logistically and also talking about sending support for, with tornadoes and all this sort of business and that. And there's a lot of backroom deals going not just with NATO and because obviously Russia's not with NATO but there's a lot going on around you know that 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 doesn't get talked about and uh, I, I just think there's a lot of double dealing going on I think by all different countries regardless whether they're in NATO or not and I think um, you know uh, everybody's got this idea and I, I guess rightly so that everybody's behind this NWO and it's all one big conspiracy with all of them and, and everything like that I, I think it's a lot more complicated than that and um, you know, and I, and I think things will get out of hand because I, I don't think I don't think most of these nations' leaders are, are that clever, to be honest. And mistakes will be will be made. There'll be more jets being shot yeah, down. Being knocked down. Uh, about two days before that actually happened, I predicted to me mate who lives in the same house as his Dave. I said to him, "Look, it won't surprise me next if uh, with Russia being in there, one of their planes is knocked down, and that really will fucking tear things apart. And here we are, literally two days after. I was going to make a video of what I predicted to happen, and you can see, you can see it fucking unfolding. Um, I myself have uh, looked up quite a lot of videos on the history of how the last two world wars started. And they, both, they all started in the Ukraine, Bosnian area, do you know what I mean? It's like, fucking here we go. Yeah. And they are, they are whitewashing it, I, uh, yeah, I can see well, what they're yeah. doing there. You know, this, this, these troubles, like you say, the Slavic people are always seem to be involved. I'll, what I'll do is I'll move straight on because I don't really want to use that because it goes into the European and the and all that sort of other stuff and the political side of it, which we can all guess. And a lot of it's going to be just, you know, um, it's not really going to lead us to much. So really, I think it's going to get, it's going to escalate. And this is, 
I can't confirm this, but you won't be able to confirm it by mainstream media because they wouldn't they wouldn't do it anyway. But it, you know, here's one new your news where a lot of people go, oh, well, that old thing, you know, it's a bit of a whatever. But they've had quite a few good articles that I've followed in the past, so I thought I'd give this one some credence anyway. And it's Russia sends 7,000 troops to Turkish border as U.S. halt air operations. Right now, it's, this is another angle. This is involving yet another country. Right. Um, if this is, it all turns out to be true, and I, I don't have no um, reason to suspect that, you know, it, it, it isn't true really, because everything's escalated. Uh, I'll read you the article. It says, President, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, has issued orders to deploy nearly 7,000 troops, anti-aircraft rocket launchers, and artillery forces to the Turkish border, and for them to be in readiness for full combat. The Ministry of Defence say the legal authorization for this deployment comes from the joint Russian-Armenian missile defence system, agreed signed by Putin on the 11th of November. Uh, what does mean.com reports? With Armenia now becoming a vital part of the Russian joint air defence, this report continues. Federal Federation military forces will now be able to counter threats from Turkey coming from the nation's western border, which will mirror the air defence protection provided the Federation Aerospace and Naval Forces on Turkey's border with Syria that since being implemented this week have seen both United States and Turkish aircraft completely cease flying missions against Islamic State terrorists in this war zone altogether. Right? The important note to, to about this Federation military deployment uh, to Armenia this report says are oh, that these forces will be protected like their counterparts operating in Syria with the S-400 Triumph NATO designation SA-21 Growler medium and long-range mobile surface to air missile system and crash Krasuka 4 jamming platforms giving them near total air defense superiority over 85 percent of the Turkish territory that's an awful lot. Yeah. The, the, the Krasuka 4 broadband multifunctional jamming station is mounted on a BAE 769124 axle chassis, and like the Krasuka 2, the, the Krasuka 4 counters NATO Turkish AWACS and other airborne radar systems. The Krasuka 4 also has the range for effectively disrupting low Earth orbit LEO satellites and can cause permanent damage to targeted radio electronic devices with ground-based radars also being a viable target. No, oh, if this is true, mate, you know, we, we are, we're, we're on the brink of the, the Third World War, like, getting to a head now. It started, in my opinion, during the, uh, when the uh, Twin Towers went down, and it's just been building and building and building. Here we are now. You've got Ukraine, you've got the uh, Russians going against, put, you know, building up on, on the borders of Turkey. <laughs> Uh, you've got America funding Saddam, uh, not Saddam, sorry, um, ISIS and fucking various other groups of people. You know, the, all the weapons are coming from fucking, uh, from our countries that are feeding them. We're, we're having a proxy war. It's fucking plain and simple, isn't it? The black and white of all that region is, the fucking, it, it's, the, it's boiling now. It's, it's almost boiling. Like, almost a bit like... Not quite a, a Western Front they've opened up by using little Armenia's border to Turkey, but that, that's what they're going to do. So they're coming in from the other side, and they're going to come in, you know, they're going to sit on the border of Turkey that side, while they're in Syria on the side of the border yeah, doing their, you know, their, their Air Force bombings and, and everything like that. And they've, they've got two bases in Syria, so Turkey's being squashed, will be squashed by, by two sides from, from Russian military. So it's just all building up. Anyway, I'll just finish this article and I'll, I'll go into my last one, which you're talking about weapons by Western governments to, you know, <laughs> which is the last article, but which is undoubtedly MOD experts in this report state the reason the US and Turkish aircraft have fled from the skies over Syria. That's because of this jamming stuff. A lot of people spoke about this before it came out, you know, before they used it, because I think there was, um, when they had the, they, the, the Americans went into the, um, into the Black Sea, didn't they? And uh, one of these jets, this Russian jet, flew over one of the um, one of the big um, uh, missile crafts of, of Americans. 
uh, fleet and it completely paralysed it. It couldn't do nothing. It was like a dead duck. No radar, nothing. It's just one of these Russian jets. Obviously used this jamming equipment it, and the whole the whole ship was completely disabled. But anyway, with the criminal Erdogan regime in Turkey continuing to support Islamic State terrorists in Syria and Iraq, this report further notes President Putin's order today to begin the deployment of Federation military forces to Armenia will protect their nation's peoples from the barbaric Turkish enemies who just a century ago, 1915-1917, massacred an estimated 1.5 million women and children in what is known as the Armenian Genocide, which Turkey still do not recognize today. And to do the great shame of the United States against these Armenian peoples too, this report grimly states, President Obama this past August and for the seventh year in a row broke his promise to them to acknowledge the genocide committed against them by Turkey. The Federation, however, uh, however this report continues, is not only one of the 25 nations that has acknowledged the Armenian Genocide this past week, a bill was introduced into the Russian parliament and holding the account. Anyone who denies that a killing of the Armenians by the Ottoman Turkish forces was genocide. With Turkish President Erdogan having lashed out Russia, Germany and France for recognizing the Armenian Genocide, this report warns his actions against the Kurdish peoples in the Levant region are even more troubling, especially since past summer when he broke off all peace, uh, peace talks then. But to the Federation's greatest fears of the criminal Erdogan necessitating the deployment of thousands of Russian troops to the Turkish border, this report concludes, is, is he using of Islamic state, state terrorists to create for himself a new empire, and which he and his Prime Minister this past May 2015 made no secret of when they declared to the entire Islamic world. Now, um, it's you know I can't prove, uh, but you know th this article is right. But then, you know, the, the mainstream media is not going to um, you know say anything about it. So, but I think um, I think it's true. So because it is escalating. So anyway, with that, what you said truth just then. Yep. <clears throat> yep. About um, you know. ISIS being armed and um, given Western weapons by Western governments, you know, not you know just the USA, including our own UK government, which um, they are, they don't deny it. You know, it's um, they say it's more you know moderate rebels that they've been arming, etc., etc. Well, if, you, if you've read what's come out of that, you know, I think we, another word for moderate is arse lickers. Yeah. <laughs> well. They're the same anyway, um, but apparently uh, you can see the actions of the moderate rebels when they carried out what they'd done to that Russian um, pilot that was dropping down from his parachute. So I mean, if that's the actions of moderate rebels, uh, well, there you go. Uh, I don't see. Well, it's the, on our Taylor was saying he, they, that that's the guy who was leading uh, leading them. The sergeant was here somewhere. He uh, he was uh, connected to the far right a far right group, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. In Turkey, right. eh? Yeah. So yeah. it only goes to show the sort of people that they're uh, funding. I mean, in in uh, Ukraine, there was photographs taken of uh, soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers, with swastikas on. They'd also uh, reformed uh, a group uh, from the SS that were running in Ukraine during the Second World War. They reformed that. Yeah, you know right. I mean? So the the government that they're backing up right now, the US are backing up right now, and so is our country in Ukraine. Are fucking Nazis, mate? Uh, yeah. You know what's the crack? What's yeah. going on, really? Yep, yeah, exactly. It's destabilized the whole of the fucking you know of Europe, and that's what America's fucking doing, man. And they're starting to be seen as that, I think. Yeah. And uh, just just to take a quick note on uh, generations of people that are actually noticing because. Earlier on, I was having a conversation with someone, and they were saying like, "There's not a lot of people turned on to this." Well, I personally think that there is. I mean, even kids of 19 uh, getting in touch with us and saying, "Oh, wow, well, this is what I've just found out," and it was the same article you've just read that my 19-year-old son's found. So, people are taking notice and starting to sit up now, like even the young generations. Anyway, back on to you, mate. Yeah, no, yeah, you're absolutely right, Truth, and I hope more and more people 
you know, do their own do their own research. That's what it's about because you're not going to get it watching that square thing, tube of truth in the corner of the room. I, I got mod rid of mine years ago because um, uh, just because it, it, was, it, it is what it is, and um, that, that's what I think needs to happen. But anyway, I think more people are tuning in and doing their own thing, which is what what it should be all about. Well, well, let's hope so because there needs to be uh, you guys. If there's any uh, younger generations than ourselves out there that are under fifty, uh, welcome aboard and you know stick to what you know is true in your heart. Keep fighting. Anyway, back over, man. Sorry. That's okay. No. Well, just carrying on with your point you made there, Truth, about the you know the Western governments financing these so-called moderate uh, ripples. Um, but uh, I mean, I'd love this article to be actually, um, as, you know, the word could or should or will would be nice. But anyway, UK could be prosecuted for war crimes over missiles sold to Saudi Arabia that were used to kill civilians in Yemen. Let's hope so, eh? Yeah, let's hope so. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'll read you, I'll read you the article. I'll, I'll probably just quickly um, switch to another article to. Uh, to underline a point or two of this one, but Britain is at risk of being prosecuted for war crimes because of growing evidence that missiles sold to Saudi Arabia have been used against civilian targets in Yemen's brutal war. Foreign office lawyers and diplomats have warned. Advisors to Philip Hammond, the Foreign Secretary, have stopped, stepped up legal warnings that the sale of special missiles to the Saudis deployed throughout nine months of almost daily bombing raids in western Yemen uh, Yemen against Houthi rebels may breach international humanitarian law. Since March this year, bombing raids and blockades of ports imposed by the Saudi-led coalition of Sunni Gulf states have crippled much of Yemen. Although the political aim is to dislodge, uh, dislodge Houthi Shia rebels and restore the exiled president, Abed Rabo Mansour Hadi, thousands of Yemeni civilians have been killed with schools, hospitals and non-military infrastructures hit. Fuel and food shortages, according to the United Nations, have brought near famine to many parts of the country. Now, just to quickly click on here, I mean, if I can get on this one. You know, you look, in six months, it's 2,355 civilians in six months, right, that have been killed by Saudi um, planes. Wow. And all sorts of things, yeah. You know, you know Stav, I, I remember watching a, a documentary called Dirty Wars where it talks about what's happening in Yemen um, to do with JSOC, which for those that aren't aware, Google it and find out. JSOC, pretty straightforward. Yeah, until you start reading, that is. But yeah, that's, you know, that's shocking that statistic there for the past six months, Andy. Let you yeah. carry on anyway. I, I mean, h how many, you know, Yemeni flags on Facebook? You know, how many, um, again, we come back to that, you know, a lot, a lot of people have said, you know, uh, I'm with solidarity well, with the French. Well, Andy, people. there's an easy answer to that, and it's called people are, bl are blinded by um, mainstream media news at the end of the day, and it? We're, we're being blatantly lied to. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly true. If it's, you know, again, I get, I, I, I'm not putting any defence for, for, for the... Oh, it's got to be said, sheep or who, who are not looking for themselves, who need to look for themselves. I mean, come on, you know, you it's not that far away. You, you know, Google's there, all you got to do is click it and put a couple of words in, and you can find most of this stuff. It's not it's not rocket science, really. It's switching on and saying, look, I don't trust the mainstream, I want to find out for myself. That's all it is. And, you know, they don't have to agree with what they find. It's just a question of do your own research. That, that's that's all I say to people. Uh, I get people that disagree with me on my Facebook page. I, I say I'm not agreeing. I'm not telling you this is the truth. It's just put out there and says, you know, go and look for yourself and make your own mind up. That's what it's all about. You know. Yeah. I, I, I think many actually uh, know there is something wrong, but they're just frightened to look behind the curtain because they think the boogeyman's going to get. Um, Absolutely, mate. Scared, Steph. Too scared to look, um, and you switch off from it. Uh, yeah. There's lots of people I meet in the pub when you try talking to them. They get quite offended that you want to talk about politics in a pub. Back in yeah. the day, it was the place where people would 
would meet up and have a good old gas about. That's right, that's what it was. It was the local community's networking system where the news got passed through the grapevine. Well, I, you know, I to uh, truth and Paul, I would say politics kills massively, massively. Politics, and if you want to go and check the word democide, is the biggest killer of humanity in history. Democide is death by state, by government. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so to those people that say, "Oh, you know, I don't want to talk politics." Politics kills big time, and that's 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 the truth of it all. Because, <laughs> you know, my dear old dad said, you know, if you got rid of um, religion and politics, it'd be a much more peaceful world. I mean, you know, that's that's pretty obvious. Yeah. So, and he, yeah. It's a killer disease. <laughs> If you've got the barricades of knowledge around you, something's not going to bite you in the ass. And the only way to get that knowledge is to start looking. Be curious. Get to understand what's happening. Not just right in your local vicinity, but further afield. Absolutely, Paul. Absolutely. And I think, you know, um, the more we can awake people to, to, to be kind of crappy thing off that, True, but truth. I mean, it's the same old regurgitate. They must realise it's the same old regurgitate. You know, Manchester United playing Liverpool. Who won six months ago? Liverpool won there. They're playing again. It might be a different result. Who gives a shit about football? I mean, what is football anyway? If it ain't fixed most of the time, which it is. But there you go. I'm, I'm not going. Well, to... it's the tribal thing. Is football? It's it's yeah. that tribal feeling that we've all got on is, uh, and the people in power and the stuff know that they've got to provide some kind of games. They've known it since Roman times when they invented the games. Yeah, yeah, Brings yeah. people together, keeps people focused on something rather than something that they don't want people focused yeah, on. That's now. right. It's another diversionary tactics. It's a magician's tricks. He's got it in his box to use, and he pulls it out quite frequently. Well, as you, as you all quite rightly said, you know, it all comes mostly through your TV, so my recommendation is to box it up and ship it to either Rupert Murdoch or David Cameron. If everybody did that, I think that might, you know, solve a few things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the old Magi trick. Keep watching this end, watching this end, watch this end here, watch this one I'm redoing in front of your eyes. Yes, it's... Um... But uh, anyway, I'll anyway my, my uh, concern is what um, are people actually doing about it right now? I mean, you know, there's protests and stuff get, gets organised in London, but for people locally, nothing I see happening on Facebook. You know, there's no one putting out videos saying that they've gone to the local council, you know, in groups to say maybe that the war that our, our government are engaged in is 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 immoral, it's wrong, you know, they're breaking uh, the Geneva Convention, the, you know, they're breaking your, uh, the European human rights, and, you know, they're breaking so many of their own fucking laws. Well, the, the, joke about that, the joke about that is really is the next line in this article. You right, know, go for it, yep. They've got, um, you know, Amnesty International, Human Rights, what? Hang on a minute. Who's now in charge of human rights in the United Nations? Who's in charge of it? Saudis, is it not? It's the UN, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Saudis head of, head of that. Yeah, well, they're in charge of... You can't make this shit up, can you? You really can't. Are they... Are they, are they sorry, are they, uh, are they Saudis the head of the appeals? They're, in, they're, head, they're head of, of, of what, you know? Yeah. yeah. Someone's not turning yeah. the phone on and off. It's like putting the fox to watch over the chicken house, isn't it? How many, how many guys have they, they beheaded in public executions? Uh, 150, I think, I read the other day. Uh, yeah. You know, they've beheaded more people than ISIS. You know, these are the people. Anyway, I'll finish the article. I think we can go on and then, then, then we can, uh, I'm pretty much done. I'll hand it over to PJ. We can, we can talk more about this. But anyway, Human Rights Watch. And other NGOs claim there is no doubt that weapons supplied by the UK and the United States have hit Yemeni civilian targets. One senior foreign and Commonwealth officer, FCO legal advisor, told the Independent the Foreign Secretary has acknowledged that some weapons supplied by the UK 
have been used by the Saudis in Yemen. Are our reassurance correct that such sales are within international arms treaty rules? The answer is sadly not at all clear. Although the Department for International Development recently received assurances, oh yes, sure. Um, let me just put this up for a minute because it might go funny on the audio. Um, assurances from the Saudi government that it did not want a famine to develop on its doorstep. There was concern with the FCO that the Saudi military's attitude to humanitarian law is careless. Officials fear that the combination of British arms sales and technical expertise used to assist bombing raids on Yemen could result in the UK being hauled before the International Criminal Court on charges relating to direct attacks on civilians. I hope so. Another government lawyer warned with Britain now expected to join the United States and France in the war on ISIS in Syria, there will be renewed interest in the legality of the assault in Yemen. It may not be enough for the Foreign Secretary to simply restate that we have yet to carry out any detailed evaluation of UK arms used in the bombing of Yemen. The legal advisor said Yemen could be described as a forgotten conflict. You can say that. Inside the Foreign Office, a course correction is seen as crucial. It is a proxy war, as truth says, with the Saudis believing Iran is behind the Houthi rebellion. Olive of uh, Sprague, Amni Amnesty International arms trade director, told, <laughs> told the Independent there is a blatant rewriting of the rules inside the FCO. We are not supposed to supply weapons if there is a risk they could be used to violate humanitarian laws and the International Arms Treaty, uh, which we cha championed. It is uh, illogical for Philip Hammond to say there is no evidence of weapons supplied by the UK being misused, so we keep selling them to the point where we learn they are being used. Let me read that again. So we keep selling them to the point where we learn they are being used. Uh. Most of Saudi's weapons are supplied by the United States with help from the UK and the US is also offering logistical support, airborne refueling with a specialist Pentagon approved team providing intelligence on targeting. This month the Obama administration authorized $1.2 billion to Saudi request to replenish stocks of specialist missiles, a move seen by critics as an effort to assuage Saudi anger over the US brokered nuclear deal with Iran, the kingdom's key regional rival. Um, um, it goes on quite a bit more. It's quite extensive about it all. If you want to read the articles, because it's really, really extensive, it's the um, the Times of India. There you go. So you can get all this information from thousands of different places. You don't have to put, I'm not even going to say it, because every time I say this, I feel physically sick inside. And that's the corporation, you know, the main one. Yeah. Yep. I can't even bring myself to say it, but I feel physically sick. And anybody who quotes on Facebook to me using that 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 news agency propaganda, right? I, I just I don't I can't even answer them. I just I just actual fact I might say once to them, don't quote me from that line of um, you know then, because if you do again, I'm just going to remove you as a friend, and I tell them what I think of of them. So um, I just can't, you know. Um, but you don't have to go to those people because you're just going to get a load of shit. I'll be honest, propaganda, uh, mainstream propaganda for the UK government and Western governments. So um, yeah, to 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 me, the way I look at all of this, though, um, what can you believe and what you can't you believe? You do, no, none of us know, but. What I do know for certain is some big shit's going down around the whole fucking world, mate. And it's, you know. I'd, I'd, what I'd, I'd rather believe, as I said to PJ earlier on, Truth, I'd have more belief in an alien invasion from from Galaxy Andromeda than the, the lies and, the, and what they put out as what's causing the problems in the world today. We know what's causing the problems in the world today. If you've got your eyes half open, you only have to read from history for crying out loud, you know? So, um, I have more, more belief in, you know, little green man in flying saucers coming here to declare a war in the world than I would 
you know, what the mainstream propaganda crap puts out, that's for sure. So, anyway, I've finished my articles. Like I say, you can check all these ones. That one's um, with, uh, Times of India. Um, that one's uh, your newswire. And uh, this one is Russian Insider. And I think the other one was Ar Arabi. Or Jadid, whatever that means. <laughs> but there's plenty out there. Uh, go, go, go and find out and look for yourselves and do your own research. That's what I say. Well, that's me done, PJ. Back to you, mate. Yeah, can I just say something quickly, like uh, about, you know, um, again, about people uh, being aware and different age groups and stuff. <clears throat> there's a guy that used to live next door to me last year, and with how we've seen it escalating, he was uh, living in London during the Blitz and all that, carrying kind of like, and he was back in crashing in his back garden one day. And I put my head out of the bedroom window and shouted. I said, hey, mate, what are you up to? He's as busy as out. So I thought, you have to cut out the lock. So I went round and he converted, like, uh, a slingshot into, a, like, a bow and arrow. He was making loads of arrows up and stuff. I was like, what are you doing, man? He said, well, I'm preparing. There's an old group of us, man. We've, you know, we've got a cave to go to. We've been collecting water and food. And you know, I'm like, bloody. And this was last year. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, there's something on the agenda if even people that age group who's lived through the Second World War, if they're seeing things coming and getting prepared for themselves, stocking water and food. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, they, they can see it coming. They know the history of the world, man. Where are we heading to is the big question mark. And how the fuck are we going to stop it? Well, we, we've got, we've got to, it's our responsibility to, the, to do the best we can to wake enough people up so that we can all stand up and Go say. Up. You're done right. I totally agree. Enough, it's enough. You know, you we're not. I tell you what. There's the keys to the house. There's the keys to the car. There's your poxy job. There it is. I've had enough. That's what it's going to take. And it'll take no less than that. It's going to take massive dis uh, massive civil disobedience that the world has never seen before. That is what it needs. I'm not over-egging it because these psychopathic bastards are not going to stop. And that's all the leaders, not just ours, eh? Yeah, no, that's right. But you've got to start somewhere and you can only start in your own place, really, and say, no, you're taking the piss. That is enough. You know, game over. This is, that's it. No more. No, well, no. A little idea that, I, uh, that I've got is um, we can maybe embarrass uh, local councils around the country by making banners up and have what you call maybe a silent protest where nobody actually turns up and could be held responsible for having it. We're just laying banners and and uh, paper articles of uh, you know what they've been doing behind the scenes that they're not telling the public about and laying it all at the council door. So on a Monday morning, it just looks like people have just emptied loads of their rubbish onto their fucking path, you know. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you something now, Truth, right? If anybody, right, if anybody's getting demands from local councils for council tax demands and all this shit, turn around to the council, right, and say, take it out of your unusable reserves. That'll make them gulp. That'll make them gulp indeed. Yeah, well, I personally have never paid it because uh, I know a percentage of it goes to illegal wars in foreign countries there. Uh, for so-called democracy, but really for oil, eh? And that's how it's panned out over the years I've been alive. Yeah, yeah but, but yeah. truth, if, if you don't know about that, then it's fine to pay council tax, yeah? As long as you don't know about it. If you know it doesn't take place and it doesn't happen, you're welcome to pay. <laughs> well, this is, well, this is what it's all about, PJ, isn't it? It's about, and I agree with uh, truth, yeah, rallies and marches, get out there, put the word out, show the people, do the what. But just going for two or three hours and going, I protest and going home and then getting in your car on a Monday morning and going back to your, your J-O-B is not going to achieve anything. It's all good, but it needs a hell of a lot more. Hmm. Well, I'll give you more if you're ready for it. Okay. I'm ready. All right, let's see what I've got. All right, this is just uh, same as what you've already gone over, stuff. Uh, you can see my screen all right, yeah? Yep. Yep, yep, all right. So this, is, uh, this is the mystery of rule bomb Turkish convoy allegedly carrying weapons to militants in Syria, which is what Stav's already gone over. I'm just going to show you these few pictures that were on this uh, article while I've got it up. Um, 
We have actually, it does end in the article on the 26th of November stating that at the time there was no authorities, Turkish or Russian, that had commented on the incident, but we now later know of who's allegedly um, commented and put their hand up for it. So over to my next one, which is a, another photo. This is the picture of uh, the, the Russian fighter pilot, the one that died. For those that never saw it. And my uh, next one is Turkey NATO crisis sets scene for Europe's new EU army. Article by Patrick Enninson, dated yesterday on 21st Century Wire. Goes to say, they say there are no coincidences in politics and foreign affairs. Have you got a comment? Um, well, I, I definitely know that Patrick Enninson knows his stuff. He really does, you know. He, he, he gets straightforward sourced information, so, he, you know, Whatever this guy says, you you can take it to the well. I wouldn't take it to the bank, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll read rest of it. Less than two hours after Turkey shot down a Russian fighter inside of Syrian airspace, moves are already afoot to increase the role of Europe in Syria. The Russian plane's downing has already frozen Russian-Turkish relations, and neither side shows any sign of backing down on this issue. Um, is anybody wanting to comment in as we've got a bit of feedback on my side? Yeah, I'm sure RT had, uh, had, had said something about the, the, the children's situation out on that, like Russia's um, kind of uh, OK about it, but that other article says that they're building up troops on the Turkey border, like, so... <laughs> <laughs> as good as mine, man. <laughs> All right, Jeremy. And is Black Hole got his mic muted? Yeah, I keep muting mine. Okay, someone out there in there. All right, no worries. Just the feedback's overpowering on my side. Uh, Germany has now joined the party this week by revealing its intention to deploy ground troop troops in the fight against ISIS. Angela Merkel's government announced its plan to send 100 Bundeswehr special forces into northern Iraq to support of the Kurdish Peshmerga forces. Britain is not far behind either, as David Cameron intensifies his lobbying efforts to get his country into the war in Syria. Is this part of a de facto nation action now? Uh, NATO action now? Or NATO by fiat? If only it were that simple. There is much more going on here than what meets the eye. With Germany now entering the fray, this brings a total of at least five major NATO member states who are either actively involved in the fight or about to enter the combat theatre. The most important point here is that each and every one of these countries is in the conflict in clear violation of international law. Neither has the backing of the UN Security Council or as an invitation from the legal and international recognised government in Damascus. In addition, none of these actors is acting under NATO Article 5. In other words, none has been attacked by another internationally recognized nation state of entity, uh, although it's curious why the Western governments have insisted on referring to a brutal terrorist group as a state, unless of course they recognize it as such, which somehow gives them the color of law in Article 5. So what gives them the right to pass the law and then fucking not abide by it, eh? The right to pass the law on what? The, the laws that they're breaking about it not going through... Oh, uh, yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't been passed, they've got no... Yeah. yeah. What the is the right? The fucking gangsters, man. Yep, for all intents and purposes. NATO is already in. Here are the five major NATO members, all of whom appear to be operating under highly dubious mandates in and around Syria. So we'll start off with France. Try and make this quick. Uh, following the Paris attacks on Friday the 13th, and still without any real evidence presented to the public that ISIS itself was responsible for the Paris attacks, almost immediately, France deployed the full force of its military supposedly to hit ISIS targets in the alleged Islamic State stronghold of Raqqa, Syria. Coincidentally, 
Even mainstream reports questions what the objective of France's airstrikes were, uh, with some claiming that the French move was purely for show sure and that they could not confirm any actual ISIS militants were killed. Note that France had already been caught announcing its move of the aircraft carrier um, on to Syria on November the 5th, a full week before the Paris attacks. Of course, no mention of this in the media. Uh, aside from giving the state license to unleash a new level of domestic police state or home, more importantly, the Paris attacks gives France an immediate official entry into Syria into the Syria war. Undoubtedly, this was a huge game changer. United States, when the Islamic State Caliphate crisis uh, by the US UK government media complex in June 2014, it took some time before the US announced its grand anti ISIS coalition. Perhaps ISIS needed more time to get organized and to release a series of shocking internet videos of which the Western media fed off, and which were most proven as, mostly proven as fake and digital forgeries. Something was not right about the ISIS crisis by US media outlets who were so enthralled with the sensational propaganda videos that no one did question the lack of authenticity of what was eventually exposed as fake ISIS beheading video productions. Um, or the ISIS narrative itself. Pay attention to the, back, the piece in brackets here. Oddly, the Western media treated anything coming out as, uh, of ISIS HQ as sacred and unimpeachable in media terms. It wasn't until Iranian and Hezbollah ground forces entered the fight against ISIS that US President Barack Obama finally decided it was time to move in August 2014 by waging airstrikes in northern Iraq over the next few months, the US began assembling its anti-ISIS coalition ISIL in brackets, although it was hard to spot anyone else in the coalition other than the US. It should be noted that on the first day of the US airstrikes inside Syria, uh, it was pretty clear that the US had actually bombed a series of empty buildings in Raqqa. Uh, not a good start to the big push. At that point, our suspicions were confirmed that the US had no intention of actually rooting out ISIS and that secretly Washington was actually hoping that ISIS and other terrorist brigades on the ground could do what their previously, previous po proxy ground force, the Free Syrian Army, could not do, which was to overthrow the government in Damascus, which Washington and its allies referred to uh, just in like Iraq in 2003, the Assad regime. So over to the not so great Britain at the minute. It's no surprise that the British Tory government has been chomping at the bit to get into the Syrian war. In August 2013, they nearly got their mandate but lost it in a parliamentary vote. Some Tory ministers had public, public temper tantrums. As it turns out, the pretext for their entire push for war WMDs, aka chemical weapons, sarin gas, allegedly deployed by Syrian government forces, which was exposed as a false flag attack, and the US UK's attempt to blame Syrian President Bashar al Assad was a media fiction, just in like just in like Iraq in two thousand and three. A chemical attack launched by the US led coalition's moderate rebels in order to blame the government of Syria and trigger a Western intervention. The plan was a complete failure, so bad in fact it caused the US to back off um, back off their own war vote a month later in September of 2013. It seems that the Paris attacks has, uh, have also given David Cameron some wind in his war sails too. And yesterday we discovered that the French government is now lobbying for Britain's Royal Air Force to join in the scrum, with uh, London stating that it in quotes, will soon be working side by side with their French counterparts, end quote. Uh, in taking military action in Syria, in order to help sell this new leg of the war, the French were provided the use of famed liberal British newspaper, The Guardian, to openly lobby for British involvement by claiming it would put additional and extreme pressure on the ISIS terror network. The article goes on to describe the work Britain is already doing as part of that coalition. Uh, so what 
what's Cameron's rush to get deeper into the Syrian side of the conflict, you might ask? It appears as if the Paris attacks have got, has given Cameron a new lifeline on the Syrian war vote, one he's long been pursuing. This shock and horror of Paris will certainly help his case pass muster with public opinion in accepting his long-term agenda to deploy mili British military assets in Syria. One reason is to showcase British hardware um, to the world's lucrative arms sales market, something Cameron is no stranger to. After performing the role as sales closer to for BAE Systems and other firms landing billion dollar contracts in the Gulf in recent years. Currently Cameron is desperate to rescue those contracts which threaten to be scrapped over an inconvenient human rights row between Westminster's political left and the kingdom over Saudi's plan to behead and crucify a 17 year old boy. The son of a Shia activist uh, covering Saudi's Saudi Arabia's ghastly human rights record in favour of turning a few quid, uh, tens of billions for 100 typhoon jets and a prison contract, has Does always not surprised me. <laughs> has always been an obsession of Westminster, coupled with the Syria issue. Uh, this last row has prompted some of the most amazing double speak and spin ever seen coming out of the Foreign Office as evidenced by this humdinger about the world's most misunderstood feudal kingdom, Saudi Arabia, seemingly straight out of the Office of Information Dispersal. Uh, moving on now, you can read most of this article in your own time. Into German air this week, German Defence Minister Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the Foreign Minister Frank Walter Steinmeier, Interior Minister Thomas de Maizer, and Justice Minister he Hikamas drafted a plan for military intervention and, seek, and held a secret meeting on Thursday to discuss exactly how this would be managed in terms of public relations. Uh, Build newspaper reported there are some historic considerations regarding Germany in this story too. RT adds the cabinet is set to discuss the bill that may raise the question of a constitutional change on December the 17th. German basic laws, law has strict limits on military involvement since the end of World War II, originally destined to prevent a revival of Nazi crimes. Uh, considering how Turkey's recent dangerous pro 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 provocation stunt was not incident and how NATO members are beginning to back away from Turkey slightly, albeit temporarily at least, the international focus is finally sh shifting towards Turkey's obvious and direct role in facilitating and even supporting the rise of ISIS and al-Nusra which is uh, al-Qaeda in Syria pretty much and many other Islamic fighting militant fighting groups active in Syria. Uh, last bit on Turkey, Turkey is guilty on potentially two international war crimes according to the Geneva Conventions one for shooting down an aircraft in Syrian airspace it's becoming clear, clearly, clearer by the day that the Turkish F-16 air-to-air missile may have been fired in Turkish airspace but even the US now believe the missile actually hit the Russian fighter in Syrian airspace a clear war crime. Also the fact that Turkey is providing direct support to the same jihadi Turkmen insurgents who then shot and killed a Russian pilot who, uh, while he was parachuting in the air is another war crime, in fact, one of the NATO-backed moderate terrorists who boasted of killing the downed pilot is actually a Turkish citizen with links to both elected officials and an ultra-nationalist group, the Grey Wolves, based in Turkey. Nonetheless, uh, we cannot discount the possibility that Washington DC put Turkey up to shooting down the Russian plane. After all, Turkey hosts multiple U US military facilities and shares the same objectives in Syria as well as being accomplices in many of the same cr crimes. Um, uh, moderate terrorist training, weapons trafficking, money laundering, oil smuggling and constantly lying to their own people and the world. This is only the beginning of Turkey's problems. Uh, the president has been accused of harboring a sultan complex hoping to lead Turkey's restoration to its former seat at the head of the Islamic world in an Ottoman caliphate redux. 
add to this for fresh allegations of well, his mate, to be honest with the Ultimate Empire talking about that I've been watching a bit about that and that was running through my mind as you said that like <laughs> that's that <laughs> uncanny that is of what I was thinking there and then you read the bloody line out that's amazing that's, um, that's Patrick Ennison for you <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we can see how this Mafia state may have too many crimes to answer for when it's all said and done. If Turkey becomes an international pariah for its increasing, increasingly obvious collusion with IS, um, ISIS and the wider terrorist conclave gallivanting free, freely through Syria and Turkey, that there could be calls for NATO to dump the rogue state and bad actor in the Syrian conflict. Uh, I'm not going to read much more to this. Um, mm. PJ. Yeah. Uh, um, there is actually Ron sent me an article from Veterans Today, which is a pretty good site. Yeah. And uh, um, I don't know if we got screen share whether I could just quickly not not um. Interrupt. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I'll do is uh, I'll pass it over to you for that, and then when you finish with that, you can uh, play the Dennis Skinner video if you want, because <laughs> it is okay. nice words to say. Have you finished up on those ones then? Yeah, yeah I mean, pretty much for now. I've got to come back on a few other things, but okay, right. Okay, you let me know when it's when it's yeah, there. It's all good. Yeah, okay. Well, this is the Veterans Today, which is a pretty good site to 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 you know. The ISIS beheadings Turkey sends Turkey sends U.S. cameras. Captured IS beheading film crews tells their secrets. Right, basically. It says here you know, they're trained. They're sent. They're trained how to do photographic images, how to put it out, what not to show. And this is all done by Turkey with the IS militants. They train them up. They give them these expensive cameras. And this is Washington Post interview with seven men affiliated with ISIS terrorist groups serving. Uh, serving or have served time in Marco jails emerged brilliant details about the ISIS propaganda factory. These men, man, these men say and describe how videographers, photographers, and editors are ranked high, higher than the soldiers as ISIS dedicates itself to brainwashing Muslims across the globe. Okay, this is all aided and abetted by Turkey from its headquarters in two-story residential building in Raqqa. Syria, the media division oversees hundreds of recruits, mainly fighters, who have been put through two months of military training and a month of media training. So uh, I won't read you the whole thing, but Abu Muhammad al dalami the Islamic State spokesman, is believed to be the kingpin of the media division, according to the Post, which is mainly manned by Westerners with a background in German journalism or technology. Once approved, the prisoners told the Post the media recruits are put on a $700 a month salary with free state-of-the-art uh, equipment shipped in from Turkey, then start receiving daily assignments. Militants, meanwhile, receive £100 a month. They are sent all over the caliphate, the region of Iraq and Syria that ISIS occupies, in order to film slayings, landscapes, anything. These shots are put on a hard drive, delivered to one of the 36 offices, and compiled into slick clips, such as this week's video threatening to bomb New York. You, you know, you can go and read that article if you like. It's very uh, enlightening, to say the least, about how this whole thing is, who puts it together, how it's put together, who's following whose orders, who gets financed, who gets trained, who gets given the, the equipment. You know. so, so if America's backing up uh, Turkey, um, but yet they're, they're supplying money to ISIS yeah. and fighting against their ex-enemy, uh, the Taliban and all them lot, uh, you know what? It's, it's, like, it's, it's like they're trying to... Uh, maybe America's made a deal with uh, Turkey that they can be the head of the Ottoman Empire again, providing you play our fucking game. Uh, you know... Confusion, isn't it? Uh, yeah. All the different sides of the, the yeah, don't, supporting them. Don't, don't forget it, Truth and Paul and PJ and anybody else is listening. This is a NATO country. Turkey is NATO. If the Russians drop one bomb on Turkey, well, then the whole of NATO yeah. have to go to Russia. You're obliged to by treaty. 
This is our This guy here. Yeah. Is, um, I mean, it, it, and it, it is off, blatantly obvious to anybody with two brain cells to rub together that ISIS is a complete and utter construct just for a premise to go into this third world war. Oh, yeah, Well, it's already started. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And people can't see it. Well, NATO's days are numbered, and it looks like there's a split between the US and the EU. So anything can happen. Yep, I'd totally go with that one, like EJ, yeah. definitely. Well, anyway, they, they, if anybody wants to know, they want some information about other sites and that, I mean, Veterans Today is pretty good. I look at that quite a bit. Um, and thanks to Ron, my mate, for sending me the, me the article. Um, this is a. Do you want to explain this video, PJ? This is um, Dennis. Yeah, I think it's self explanatory. I think you should just play it for what we've talked about so far. Dennis Skinner pretty much just rounds it all up, really, doesn't he? Yeah, this was after the what debate, what I don't suppose what you call it, I suppose they call it a debate in Parliament on Tuesday. The reasons why Cameron wants to uh, convince the House and get to support the House before he puts it on the floor. This week, after today, it could be tomorrow, it could be Tuesday, but it's definitely be this week, I would think. And whether uh, you know we can get full support from Parliament or enough majority at least, so that they can start playing their games. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But anyway, here's the video. Let's let's put it on. Can you wide screen that for me? Isn't it essential in any prelude to a war? to be sure of your allies and to be sure of the objectives. Isn't it a fact that Turkey has been buying oil from ISIL, they used Turkey's trucks to store it, they've been bombing the Kurds and the Kurds are fighting ISIL, they shot down a Russian jet even though Russia is wanting to fight ISIL he has got an objective to get rid of Assad. A Russian ally has got the opposite objective. What a crazy war. Enemies to the right of us, enemies to the left of it. Keep out. Well, the, the one thing I do agree with the Honourable Gentleman about is we should be clear about our allies and our objectives. Well, wow, well, that... that Definitely says it all, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, what can you add? Add to that, stay the fuck out of it. Excuse my language. <laughs> the punching psychopaths in Parliament. Yep. I, I mean, you know, that he was the only guy. I mean, I listened to it on uh, somewhere on, uh, on the radio. I listened to some of it, and I did actually hear Skinner say that live, and I, and I thought, he's the only one. Yeah, he is. He's the, he's the only one I've heard uh, speak as strongly about the subject. Well, uh, what makes you amazing? Days. What amazes me That's is off to the guy, eh? you yeah. barely see any ministers on the TV. It's generally uh, Cameron or, or Osborne, you see. You barely see any of the ministers or the shadow government on camera nowadays. What is going on? Why are we not seeing them? Well, there's one thing I in that I, I would say his father, his father will be rolling in his grave, and that's Hillary Benn. His father, Tony Benn, will be rolling in his grave. Yeah. Because he's decided to back the conservative. Can we, uh, can I just stop you there? Um, incredible feedback coming back on you. Right, hang on then. Let me, what, do you want me to move up? Uh, just to try and allow, you know, each other to talk freely with... Other mics closed, they'll probably solve it. Okay, well, I think we're all passionate about this. <laughs> um, basically, yeah, Hillary Benn uh, has come out and, and and he's going to back the Conservative uh, for, for going in and bombing. And, and I, I think his father would be not the disappointed, wouldn't be the word uh, after you know what uh, what Tony uh, Tony Benn, his father, for years and years and years. Um, talked about uh, that war is not the answer, and he—I don't think 
he would have supported this in the slightest. So, I, 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 if I, you know, Hillary Benn should hang his, his head in shame, and as a Labour politician, it, um, he's prepared to go against his his leader, which is Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, I found a little bit tight, a little bit tight. But there you go. Uh, that's just my 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 thought. Okay. But uh, anyway, okay, carry on, Pete. So I just finish off with what I've got then, yeah. Yeah, you've got another one for me to play, haven't you? Uh, yeah, not just yet though. Um, this one's from the Sunday Zaman. Terrorism, radical Islamism, turn lives of European Muslims into nightmare. This is a picture in 2005. Um, it's just a, a Muslim woman wearing a burqa scene walking on a street in Brussels. Uh, I'll quickly read majority of this article because it's attached with yet another one. Uh, the failed Paris attacks that left um, a number that no one can really work out because I, I've never been able to find out exactly how many died. Uh, maybe somebody can help me with that. Uh, th anyway, the people that died in the French capital on November the 13th have revealed once again <clears throat> that the biggest threats to Muslims, Muslim people living in Europe, are those so-called Muslims who see no problem with killing innocent people in the name of Islam and the fake Imams who groom them. Uh, although they are act they are currently associated with guests work workers escaping from their hometowns due to the financial troubles and refugees escaping from internal conflicts in their countries, the history of European Muslims is quite old. Uh, this history, which first started in 711, uh, when Tariq ibn Zayad, the Umayyad military general, conquered al Andalus from Spain has passed numerous stringent tests of the years. It resulted in a struggle for existence and this struggle has not yet completely ended. European Muslims were hurt by the strong reactions of Salman Rushdie's novel The Satanic Verses in 1989, uh, the 2004 murder of Theo van Gogh, uh, the Dutch director of the Move Submission, the Danish cartoon crisis that erupted in 2005, and the deadly attack on French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo of this year. But they managed to survive. The struggle will also continue after the recent attacks in Paris. Considering French President Francis Hollande said following the attacks that France was at war with cowards, it is right to say the Paris attacks have strengthened Samuel Huntington's thesis, The Clash of Civilizations. Uh, French far-right National Front Party leader Marine Le Pen, uh, who views Muslims as a disease that settled into European society, has gave prominence following the attacks. She will probably be elected as French president in the next election. The extreme right-wingers in Europe are using the recent terrorist attack in Paris as an effective tool to expand their bases. It is certain that attacks will have some political consequences. On the other hand, hatred is emerging in society against Muslims in European countries. There have been large and small attacks against Muslims, Muslim residents in various European countries following the Paris attacks. Similar to the aftermath of other terrorist attacks that took place in the continent previously, these attacks cannot be, mis uh, cannot be underestimated, but it would be wrong to claim by analysing the recent attacks that Muslims in Europe are under great danger. It is right that Muslims, uh, who for years have been trying to tell people via their lives and views that I Islam cannot be associated with terrorism, feel embarrassed by the attacks, although they have conducted various campaigns in which they condemn terrorism and shouted the slogan, a Muslim cannot be a terrorist, it seems impossible to convey their messages to Europeans for, for now. Just like the previous attacks, the Paris incident has raised, or have raised, the walls between European and Muslim communities much more. However, there are still many reasons to be hopeful about the future despite all problems. First of all, a new Muslim community is slowly emerging in Europe. This new community is leading a life in line with European standards. Uh, this community is still in the process of being established. The development of this new community is important not only for the future of European Muslims, but also for the future of Muslims living in other countries across the globe. 
The biggest threat to this new community is not Europeans who are against Islam, but those so-called Muslims who are alienated from the basic values of Islam with every passing day. Those terrorists who assault Europe are from those so-called Muslim countries or are raised by Imams from those countries. Those fake Imams cannot understand that another Muslim community dis distinct from theirs can exist in their countries. They don't believe the new community can be better than theirs at all. Such so-called Muslims are actually the biggest obstacle preventing the integration of Muslim and non-Muslim communities in Europe. Um, this then goes on to this article which basically is rounded up pretty simple in headline. Uh, Ankara, Sinai, Beirut, Paris, is ISIL the new Al-Qaeda? Uh, have a quick look at that, freeze frame it if you want to read. I'd say so. reading. <laughs> I don't think I'll need to be reading that. Um, those that want to look at it can go and find an article and have a look. So this takes me into Stop the War Coalition and many other things. Um, as lately, we've seen a lot happen as of yesterday. Um, estimated 5,000 is what I heard, but you know, maybe more is going to come in the next days and weeks, depending on what actions and decisions are made by you know who. Um, just a little few images there, just to show you what's happening. So, back onto this. Uh, this is the Al Jazeera bombing Syria. Thousands hit the streets in Europe, uh, which has just got a nice little video that I'll let Andy play for me, if he's about ready for it, that is. Yep, that's on, well. Stav will play it for you, okay? Stav will play it, yeah. Do apologise. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, there you go, Stav. I'll, I'll let you play that for me. Okay, well, it's, it's you know, Al Jazeera. If you know Al Jazeera, then you know Al Jazeera. Not one of the first that I would go to, but it, it, it just, it's just a video on the bit, on the, just to show you how many people turn out. So, go, give it a go. Well, in the play. Outside Downing Street, the first of what organisers say will be a tidal wave of protests. For now, the crowds are modest. Parliament prepares for a crucial vote on Syrian airstrikes next Wednesday. These demonstrators, including politicians, musicians and film stars, want their say. In my lifetime, I, I've not seen violence uh, along these. I don't think we accept it in our families, in our workplace. We don't accept it between a man and his dog. We don't accept it between parents and children. Why are we even contemplating the idea that violence is the solution to this? We certainly should be tackling ISIS, but the way of doing it is not to go and bomb them, which is exactly what they want, which would dignify their position. To start trying to stifle the money that's going to them. The Stop the War Coalition accused the government of having no clear strategy when it comes to Syria. They say that 14 cumulative years of bombings in Afghanistan, Iraq, and now what's happening in the Middle East only threatens to inflame tensions even further and bring more bloodshed. Europe streets. On Thursday, the British Prime Minister launched a campaign of his own to persuade lawmakers of the need for airstrikes. British bombers have already been hitting ISIL targets in Iraq since last year. He said the fight against ISIL in Syria shouldn't fall to other countries. We shouldn't be content with outsourcing our security to our allies. If we believe that action can help protect us, then with our allies, we should be part of that action not standing aside from it. Two years ago, David Cameron wanted to launch airstrikes to oust Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. That vote was defeated. But after the attacks in Paris, France has been assembling a coalition of the willing to destroy ISIL, seen by many as posing a more direct threat to national security. This was the scene in 2003, when a different British government, led by the former Prime Minister Tony Blair, wanted to invade Iraq the biggest protest in British history against a war many saw as illegal. Today the Prime Minister says airstrikes are needed for self-defence. A growing number of people believe him. Despite this opposition, it's a vote the British government thinks it can win. Eve Barker, Al Jazeera, London. Well, that's all I can say to that. 
And ladies, is uh, my ticket's booked and I'm leaving at 5 o'clock tomorrow night. <laughs> I'll be there for 11. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what goes on over the next few days in London. I'm going to be there for two weeks, eh? I hope more people yeah. come down. I think, I think basically what, what uh, Eno, the Roxy Music uh, keyboard player there, that's who that was, um, what he said is basically true. If they wanted this to stop tomorrow, right, all they would have to do is to tell Turkey to close the borders, mm. stop buying that oil, stop shipping that oil, mm. stop selling them arms, stop sending their own troops under the guise of something else. Mm. The West should cut all financial ties to do with that terrorist group. Because they do have, they should stop sending the, the arms to the so-called moderate rebels and, you know, star vices of its finance. That can all easily, easily be accomplished in a very short time. And as to, you know, stop this, uh, this, this civil war, whatever they want to call it, <laughs> call it a civil war, all of these people will start to go away. Well, uh, and, yeah, like, and uh, stop training the mercenaries yes. in, in Jordan and Turkey. Yeah. Can, can I just ask? Is, it, um, sorry, Stav, did Truth Machine say he's off to London? Yeah, I'm going down there tomorrow. I've already booked a ticket. Uh, set off at 5 o'clock tomorrow evening, get there for 11. So I'll be there for Wednesday. Uh, doing recordings. I'll um, post any videos that I get up there. Well, uh, don't, don't the worry. Axiom Club on Facebook. Oh, nice one, Truth Machine. I was just going to say, don't worry, because if you're going to London, you're safe. According to this article, that's dated 21st of May <laughs> 2015 from the Daily Fail, it says the list that reveals which cities in the world you are most likely to be the victim of a terrorist attack then goes on to suggest that Baghdad is deemed the most dangerous on earth, with Belfast and Paris, Europe's two deadliest. And as you can see, um, just on this bit here, it says, despite this, cities like London, ranked at 400, is still a target for extremists. So it's not a target for terrorists. It's only, <laughs> it's only a reasonable target for extremists. A fear mongering against a non violent extremist. Should now. that not have said activist? <laughs> well, I don't know. That, that's no, that's too low grade. I've done a bit of research today because, I'm, and it's basically all stemmed from this little picture you can see of this world map, yeah, with, with the red areas supposedly being the terrorism risk, yeah? Now, yeah. Um, before I jump into this little. Thing, what you can see, I just want to point something else out, which is um, down here. It says this bit, which is a, a very Smaplecroft spokesman explained that this risk score does not necessarily reflect an, an increase in the potential for further such attacks in the French capital. However, high profile Western cities are likely to remain desirable targets for Islamist militants, right? So just hold that thought, yeah? And just remember that this was dated 21st of May 2015. So who is this company you're asking? Who is this Verisk Maplecroft? Well, we're going to go into it as far as I've uh, had time to do. This is the website that you can see. Um, my opinion from the little bit of research I've done, which I'm hoping you guys can get involved and find out what's what. Uh, I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with this personal website itself, but there you go. Um, this Verisk and Vera, it's, it, it reminded me of the Very Chip and a few other things. But basically, to my understanding, what they are, uh, are the, one of the main leading data mining, gathering, they know everything about, you know, they're able to gather information in order to give uh, a, an accurate risk assessment, if you want to call it, on many, many things. So I looked into it a bit more, and as you can see, this is a little PDF. Communication on progress to the United Nations Global Compact, because they've got a, a lot of work going off with them. Um, it's supposed to be an independent organization, by the way. Um, and it's also affiliated with this Argus. Now, I have no idea this is new to me, so I, I don't know. But um, this is the president of... Verisk Maplecroft, her name's Sandra Scott. This is a Twitter account. If anybody wants to have a look at that. 
and this is the Argus website which has many more partners which as you can see on the screen as I scroll down you'll see many there, Datagenic, EMK, Global View, Interactive Data, The Morning Star, uh, PVM Data Services, Televent, DTN, uh, SunGuard, Market Map Energy, uh, Thompson Routers, ZE Power, it goes on and on and on anyway. So it, it led me to thinking, you know, is this the main hub where all these mainstream are getting all their information from? It, have these got anything to do with that? I'll let you guys investigate on my behalf. <laughs> But this is my final article, I think. Yeah, that um, is a really interesting fucking article, that is, mate, by the way. That's, that's <laughs> very interesting. That. I'd like to um, get some results on that guy's mother. I'm not capable of doing stuff like that. More boots on the ground, but that's going to be interesting to hear the results. From well, I, I just it just came to my mind. I thought, well, if you know, if they're so good at gathering information and, and pretty much getting a, an accurate risk assessment, then... You know, and he even the the guy, the spokesman, even went on to say back in May that that chart, what I've just showed you, which is this one, doesn't reflect. Yeah. Or, or in his words, uh, the risk score does not necessarily reflect an increase in the potential for further such attacks in the French capital. So I just thought, you know, I'll point that out on tonight's flux, which uh, leads me into this one. Israel's Leviathan Developers Inc. gas deal with Egypt. Uh, they've been an, an ongoing for many months now, but briefly, what I can say, because I'm no expert in this, uh, says Leviathan will start pumping the natural gas to Egypt beginning in 2019 or 2020 for up to 15 years, according to the agreement. It doesn't actually make it clear whether it's actually gone through or or what, but it does say it's in the final terms uh, dealing it's been negotiated soon. So I'm not quite sure if this has actually gone through or what. But it, what's interesting with this article is that Egypt used to get their um, gas from... They, sorry, Egypt used to give their gas to Israel and now due to terrorist attacks, which it says here, uh, but that deal collapsed in 2012 after unending terrorist attacks ended the flow in the gas pipeline that ran through the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, pipeline was built nearly 10 years ago uh, when gas was being piped from Egypt to Israel. So now we've had a flip. Israel's now giving it Egypt, yeah? Because of these terrorist attacks. Uh, so if they get this contract then that's that deal set in stone, I don't believe. Uh, and my final article is, if I can find it, going back to October 21st just to highlight that you know, Merkel seeks to Europeanize border controls in that emergency EU meeting that was called uh, last month uh, because of animosity over millions of migrants entering the EU has finally reached a crisis stage. I'm not reading that because we know what's happened. This is a little chart here, map showing you routes that have been blocked and, and whatnot. Uh, Hungary to Slovenia, Hungary to Croatia, Hungary to Serbia, Turkey to Bulgaria have been closed. And uh, last but not least, the COP21, or the COP21 as it's known, which is the Paris Climate Talks, which is, uh, strangely enough, taking place next week, I do believe. Um, so it's got negotiators from nearly 200 countries will meet to try and strike the first accord to limit planet warming, greenhouse gas emissions since the Kyoto Protocol in 1997. Uh, public rallies have been cancelled in the wake of terror attacks in Paris, but about 40,000 people are still expected to descend. Yeah, on, on that, on that level, I'm expecting that to be happening in London soon enough as well. I, I, I predict that that's what's going to happen soon enough, that they're going to yeah. start cancelling protests and making protests illegal. Well, if they want to do this climate talk, then you know it makes sense. So um, I do apologise, staff, but you're going to have to cope. I'll try and hide it for a second or two. This is a um, eco-activist brandalism launched Paris ad takeover. Uh, so more than 600 artworks critiquing corporate sponsors of the UN summit on climate change have been installed in advertising spaces across Paris. So this is one. I'm just going to take you through these pictures because they're quite funny. <laughs> Tackling climate change? Of course not. We're an airline. Uh, we're sorry that we got caught. That's from VW. 
we uh, knew about the impact of fossil fuels but publicly denied it. There's another one. There's David Cameron in his solutions uh, COP21 gear. Uh, that's President Hollande saying state emergency. This is the Prime Minister of Japan, who's also featured. Uh, UK Chancellor George Osborne did not escape criticism either. Uh, US President Barack Obama was shown in a poster criticizing oil pollution, swimming in water. Look, that's about it. And that's quite actually coming from from the BBC. But I thought these pictures were quite funny. <laughs> Is something to leave on more positive than what we've covered so far. Right, guys, yeah. open for comments if you want to finish this off. Just briefly on that last bit, the, 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 the um, what's taking past part. I think it starts tomorrow. It might be Tuesday. Um, you, you're going to have to throw out the the uh, anthropogenic um, global warming and everything's increasing. The mouth, the ice caps are melting. We've got to. We got to get this uh, carbon tax really nailed on. Get the corporations to pay more taxes, you know. But you know, it's not about corporations paying tax. They don't pay tax ever. Who pays the tax? Or should we say, the sweat equity? Go yeah. So that's all that's about. And yeah, it, it makes my blood boil because you know, I go on my Facebook wall sometimes, and I've got people posting up, support the, you know, the the the. <laughs> Support was coming up in Brussels this in Paris this week. You know this. We've got to get this fossil fuel. Fossil fuel. That's another misnomer, isn't it, PJ? Fossil fuel. But fossil we are. fuel. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if we've not got many more comments, uh, I just want to mention before we close off that because I'm quite interested to tune into Ian R. Crane's Humanity vs. Insanity tomorrow night at 7:30. He'll start live. Uh, don't forget about fracking nightmare at nine. I'll be interested to see what he's got to say about the recent events. Isn't there one um, test drilling going at the moment? Is it Lancashire? Yeah, I'm not quite sure, which is why I want to tune in to his show tomorrow to get the update. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to this week's uh, fracking and humanity. There was none last week. Yeah, it's on UKcolumn.org for those that not aware. So any final thoughts then from any of you guys? You're free to speak now. No, I think I, I think I pretty much said what I wanted to say. Um, and hopefully, like I say, wake up, go and do your own research. Get out there because it's it's all out there. A click of uh, Google's your best friend in that. But Google search, do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, get with it. Yeah, the, the, this business with vices, if people can't see where, where they got all their Toyota Jeeps, all their armament and everything else from, and uh, the, the radical Muslims, yet they're attacking Muslim countries, but they've not attacked Israel. Come on, wake up, people. Should that not alone tell you what's going down? Yeah, I'm awake to that one. Um, I'd like to finish up with uh, I'll see you in London if uh, if you're down there. I missed that truth machine. Say again. I says uh, I'm just going to finish off with I'll see you in London. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's listening, who's going down there? Well, allegedly that's the safe haven, according to Daily Mail article of me. Yeah, well, I'm pleased you read that to me. Like I feel so much safer now. Uh, if only I could get down to London, I feel so unsafe out here in the sticks. Well, that's your blank point for night for buggy men. <laughs> okay, cheers. Uh, any live streams for London at all, Truth? Uh, any, any you know, bamboos or anywhere we can keep sort of like, you know, anything that we can. Uh, yeah, I'll, any videos I take, I'll just put on uh, the Axiom Club uh, uh, Facebook page, and I've also got um, Truth Machine page as well on YouTube. Okay, cheers, Truth. That's great. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll be interesting to see whether uh, over the next few weeks whether they are going to start banning protests in Britain. Like, eh? I, I'm, I'm presuming that probably will be the case eventually. But I'm down there two weeks, so we'll soon see, eh? Mm. Yeah, definitely. 
Definitely. Well, if, if you're unsure, guys, I mean, don't forget about that company, Verisk Analytics. They might be able to answer your questions. Oh, I will say one more thing. If uh, anyone needs a place to stay, I've got a mate who's got a couple of boats on the Thames, and uh, I don't know where there's a couple of flats and some squats going. So uh, if you do find yourself down there and stuck with somewhere to stay, here's a call on 07904058312. Easy life. All right, Stav, I'll let you close this one for now with our uh, final video for us. Oh. From veterans. Have you not got it? <laughs> no, I haven't. I, which one was it, sorry? It was a Veterans for Peace video I thought we'd play, just to finish this off. Damn. Yeah. Veterans for Peace, uh, good bunch of guys. I think I can get it. I think I can All get right. it. We'll try and get it, because it, it would be nice to finish with. Oh, def definitely. Um, okay. Oh, here we go. Let me just share it, though. Hold on. Hang on, well, hang on I haven't got it up yet. No. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. This is a really good video. So. I was brought up to believe that Britain was a good country and that we were involved in just wars. Serving in Afghanistan, we hammered the ability of armed conflict. I was getting rather annoyed with the distortion of the truth that was told on the British television. I think it's important that we counter the myths and propaganda that the military push out about these wars, the myth uh, that, that anything which the military participates in is, is a noble cause. Here in the 21st century, we are still using violence and military force as a political instrument. I think we need to ask ourselves, are we worth more than that? Invading other nations simply to make rich men richer. Yeah, the reason why I joined Veterans for Peace is that I was outraged by the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. I believe it's down to oil. I, I feel unhappy about what's happening in um, Afghanistan, what's happening in schools where, where recruiters are going in, and I think there needs to be a counter voice. As ex-servicemen, I think we've got a good uh, platform for people to listen to us. Veterans for Peace is aimed at providing, I would say, a more realistic view of what war really is. We, having dutifully served our nation, do hereby observe our greater responsibility to serve the cause of world peace. To this end, we will work with others toward increasing public awareness of the cost of war, to restrain our government from intervening overtly and covertly in the internal affairs of other nations. to end the arms race and to reduce and eventually eliminate nuclear weapons to seek justice for veterans and victims of war to abolish war as an instrument of national policy to achieve these goals members of veterans for peace pledge to use non-violent means and to maintain an organization is both democratic and open. With the understanding that all members are trusted to act in the best interest of the group for the larger purpose of world peace.